With this lecture, we begin a discussion of cylindrical coordinates. And the next several lectures will be on various subtopics within this general topic. So what do we mean by cylindrical coordinates? Well, for our purposes, we imagine the rectangular coordinate system, x, y, and z, then cylindrical coordinates would be ones in which we have units, uh, or, or rather coordinates really, u, b, and w, such that x is a function of u and v, and y is some other function of u and v, and here's the key, uh, z is just w. In other words, we maintain the z-axis from rectangular coordinates, but then transform the x-y plane. So, for example, if we have x equals u cosine v and y equals u sine v, uh, then x squared plus y squared is equal to u squared times cosine squared plus sine squared of v, which is equal to 1. So u is equal to a constant corresponds to a circle. And we would call these circular cylindrical coordinates. If uh, a, a, a contour u is equal to a constant was an ellipse, we could call these elliptical cylindrical coordinates and so on. However, circular cylindrical coordinates are by far the most encountered in practice. And so we will just use the generic name cylindrical coordinates to mean, unless we specify otherwise, circular cylindrical coordinates. So in these coordinates, if you're in the xy plane um, and you have a constant value of u, that would define a circle. And we'll use the common notation. Uh, instead of u, we'll use rho. Instead of v, which is an angle, we use phi. And instead of w, we'll use z. So this is a circle. Rho is equal to a constant. And we define or locate a point in space by first starting at the origin, moving a distance rho out along the x-axis to this circle, and then rotating that point about the z-axis in a right-handed sense by an angle phi, and then moving up a distance z. And so that's how we locate a point in space. And writing out our full relations now, x is equal to rho cosine phi, y is equal to rho sine phi, and z is just equal to z. Now, we locate a point in space in terms of x, y, and z coordinates. We always assume that a triple of, of uh, symbols or numbers uh, represented in this form represents coordinates in the rectangular coordinate system. And those are specifically rho cosine phi, rho sine phi, and z in terms of the cylindrical coordinates. And now we can look at the change, all right, so this is position r. We can look at the change in position with respect to variations of any one of the coordinates. So we can look at the derivative with respect to rho of r. And so what would that be? Um, well, this is easy because rho is just a linear factor there. So that just, for the first one, is just cosine of phi. The second, it's sine of phi. And z has no rho dependence, so that's zero. We define the scale factor, h sub rho, to be the norm of this vector, d by d rho of r. And then the unit vector, u, well, a hat, sorry, a hat sub rho would be this vector divided by its norm, which in this case is just equal to 1 because it's the square root of cosine squared plus sine squared of phi, which is 1. And so the unit vector is just cosine phi 
sine phi zero, and the scale factor is equal to one. The derivative with respect to phi, and now we use the shorthand just curly d sub phi of r, is, let's see, the derivative of this, well, cosine, the derivative is minus the sine, so this will put a row out in front. This would be minus the sine of phi. Derivative of the sine is the cosine, and z doesn't depend on phi, so it's zero. The scale factor, h sub v, should be the norm of this vector, would be, well, let's see, it would be rho, sine squ rho squared sine squared plus rho squared cosine squared, and sine squared plus cosine squared is one, so that would just be rho squared. The square root of that would be rho. And therefore, a hat phi would be this divided by rho, which would be minus sine phi, cosine phi, zero. And of course, z is the same coordinate we had in rectangular coordinates, so the scale factor is equal to one, and the unit vector is just zero, zero, one. It's easy to verify that a hat rho dot a phi hat is equal to a hat rho dot a hat z is equal to a hat phi dot a hat z is equal to zero. So this is an orthogonal coordinate system. The unit vectors, which now are functions of position, right, um, are always mutually perpendicular. So that's very important. Why do we use a coordinate system like this? Well, let's look in the z is equal to zero or x, y plane. Here's x and y. And here's a circle. Rho is equal to a constant. Here's a distance rho, and here's the angle phi. And at that point, a hat rho is a unit vector that points radially outward from the z-axis, which is normal to this cylindrical surface. Rho is equal to a constant. And a hat phi points perpendicular, rotated 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise, or in a right-handed sense. So this is a hat rho. And here's a hat phi. So by using these coordinates, we have that, first of all, a cylinder, right, which would be very useful for representing something like, say, a wire, is represented by one of the coordinates being a constant. That makes our mathematical analysis and enforcement of boundary conditions much simpler. And the unit vector, a hat rho, is the surface normal of the cylinder. And the unit vector a hat phi is the surface tangent vector. So again, enforcing boundary conditions becomes much simpler in this coordinate system. So that's what motivates us to use different coordinate systems. Now the price we pay, of course, is now we have more complicated relationships describing um, the unit coordinate vectors. They change with position in space. And also the differential operators, things like the Laplacian and so on, become uh, more complicated. So let's take a look at those differential operators now. In one of our early lectures, we derive the general forms of the differential operators in an arbitrary orthogonal coordinate system. And we saw that the gradient of a scalar is equal to unit vector in the u direction, 1 over the scale factor hu times the derivative with respect to u of f, and then likewise the v coordinate, and likewise the w coordinate. And so in cylindrical coordinates, u is equal to rho, 
v is equal to phi, w is equal to z, and hv is equal to rho, hu is equal to 1, and hw is equal to 1. So we can plug these in, and we get that uh, the first term is a hat rho, 1 over, well, h u uh, would be equal to 1, so we don't even need to conclude that. Derivative with respect to rho of f, and then a hat phi, 1 over h v, which is h rho, uh, h v, sorry, is a uh, rho, so that's 1 over rho, the phi derivative of f, and then a z hat 1 over 1 times the z derivative of f. So there's the gradient of a scalar. For the divergence of a vector, we had 1 over hu, hv, hw, and then the u derivative of hv, hw times the u component of a plus the v derivative of hw hu times the v component of a plus the w derivative of hu hv times the w component of a. So in cylindrical coordinates, that is, see the product of these scale factors is rho, so that's 1 over rho. And we would have the rho derivative, see hv hw, that's rho times a rho, and then we've got the phi derivative of hu hw is just one, so that's just the phi derivative of a phi, and then we've got the z derivative, hu hv is rho times the z component of a, and we can break that up as um, 1 over rho times the rho derivative of rho a rho plus the phi derivative of a phi times 1 over rho. Put that out in front. Plus here, uh, rho doesn't depend on z, so we can factor it out and it cancels with this. That just leaves the z derivative of a z. So there is the divergence. So we've got the gradient and the divergence. A Laplacian of a scalar is the divergence of the gradient, and that is 1 over hu, hv, hw times the u derivative of hv hw over hu times the u derivative of f plus the v derivative of hw hu over hv times the v derivative of f that's the hu scale factor there plus the w derivative of h u h v over h w times the w derivative of f and h u h v h w is equal to one over rho and let's see so h v is equal to rho so this is the rho derivative of rho times the rho derivative of f and here h v is uh, is uh, is rho, so one over rho, and then you've got the phi derivative of the phi derivative, and then here uh, h v is rho, so you got plus rho, the z derivative of the z derivative, and so that works out then to be one over rho 
the row derivative of rho times the row derivative. Now you could, if you wanted to use the product rule to expand that out into two terms, we'll leave it in that form, usually more convenient. And then here, let's see, we've got a one over rho here and another one over there. So we got one over rho squared. The second derivative with respect to phi of f, and then this row cancels that row and you leave uh, are left with second derivative with respect to z of f. So there's the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates. So when we form the Helmholtz equation, we're going to have these three factors in there then, plus a beta squared times f. Now, finally, we have the curl. The curl of a is a hat u over hv hw times the v derivative of hw times a w minus the w derivative of hv times a v plus a v hat over h w h u times the w derivative of h u a u minus the u derivative of h w a w plus a w hat over h u h v times the u derivative of h v oops h v a v minus the v derivative of h u a u so what does that work out to be that is u is rho, so that's a rho hat. Here you've got rho is hv, remember? hv is equal to rho. hu is equal to hw is equal to one. So this is one over rho. This is the phi derivative of az. minus the z derivative of, this would be rho times a phi. So that would be minus the z derivative of rho times a phi. And we could cancel that rho if we wanted to, but I'll just leave it in this form. Plus a phi hat. And there's no uh, h v down in the denominator here, so no rho. And here would be the z derivative of a rho. Sorry, z derivative of a rho minus the rho derivative of a z. And then we've got a z hat. We've got an h v in the denominator, so that's a one over rho. This would be the rho derivative of hv, which would be rho, rho times a phi. So that would be, um, we get this one over rho there, from there, and then the rho derivative of hv would be rho, then a v, minus the phi derivative of a rho. Okay, so that's a pretty big, big mess there. We are going to make use of, just as we did in rectangular coordinates, the fact that we can represent an arbitrary solution to Maxwell's equation as a superposition of a magnetic vector potential and electric ve vector potential, both of which have only z components. So if we have A has only a z component, which would depend on, in general, on rho, phi, and z, then this curl, 
reduces because all of the terms that in, involve either an, an A row or an A fee drop out. And the curl of A then reduces down. A row hat, one over row, B derivative, derivative of AZ, that's his first term here. And then there, um, there's a fee, you've got, this term is zero because it's got an a row. So you have a minus sign, so that would be minus a phi hat, the row derivative of a z. And then this a hat z term doesn't have an a z in it, so it's all zero. So it reduces down to this, this simple formula for that special case where we have only a z component. So those are all of the differential operators we need in cylindrical coordinates. Now let's think about vector potentials. So imagine we have a magnetic vector potential A, which in principle could depend on rho, phi, and z. Well, then we know that H, magnetic field, is 1 over mu times the curl of A. And if it's a source-free region, which we'll assume J is equal to zero, then Ampere's law gives us that E is one over J omega epsilon times the curl of H. Now, if we assume that A has only a Z component, then we can use that relatively simple uh, curl relation we just derived to get that h rho is 1 over mu rho times the phi derivative of a z. And h phi is minus 1 over mu times the rho derivative of a z and there is no HZ. So this is a TMZ field. Then for E, we have to work out what 1 over J omega epsilon curl of H is when H has rho and phi components. So we use that previous expression. What we get is that 1 over J omega epsilon the curl of H breaks up as minus a rho hat, one over j omega epsilon rho, the z derivative of rho h phi, plus an a hat term, which is one over j omega epsilon, z derivative of h rho, plus an a hat z term, 1 over j omega epsilon rho, the rho derivative of rho h phi minus the phi derivative of h rho. And putting in what the h rho and h phi are from up here, we end up with these components for the electric field. E rho is 1 over j omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to rho and z of az. E phi is 1 over j omega mu epsilon rho times the second derivative with respect to B and Z of AZ. And EZ is 1 over J omega mu epsilon beta squared A plus the second derivative with respect to Z, that's AZ, sorry, of AZ. And this final result is a little bit convoluted how we, we get at it. We actually 
you just follow through directly on this expression here with this these values for the h's and use uh, follow through all the derivatives you get that this is actually one over j omega mu epsilon minus one over rho the rho derivative of rho rho derivative of a z minus one over rho squared the second derivative with respect to phi of a z but we can use the fact that a z we're only going to be interested in az's that satisfy the Helmholtz equation. The Poisson of az plus beta squared az is equal to zero. And in fact, these, other than the minus signs, <coughs> excuse me, are the first two terms of the Laplacian of az, and then the, the third term would be a plus the second derivative with respect to z of az, and you combine that with the beta squared here. And the negative of these guys is equal to move beta squared az to the right and the beta z, uh, I'm sorry, derivative with respect to z, the second derivative over to the right. And then you can replace this with that. That comes from the fact that we know that az will satisfy the, the Helmholtz equation. If we didn't know that, then we couldn't make this replacement. But this is going to be much more convenient for us. This is a much messier expression. Now, if instead we make use of an electric vector potential, and remember that concept is only valid in a source-free region, which we're assuming anyway, so no problem. Well, then the electric field is minus one over epsilon the curl of F, and the magnetic field from Faraday's law is J over omega mu the curl of E. And if we limit ourselves to a case where we have only a z component, which could depend on rho, phi, and z, then we can do a very similar analysis. And we find e rho is minus one over epsilon rho times the phi derivative of f z. E phi is 1 over epsilon times the rho derivative of Fz, and there is no Ez component, so that these are T Ez field components. And then doing J over omega mu times the curl of E, where these are the E components of E, we find by very similar series of steps to what we did for the TMZ case. H rho is one over J omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to rho and Z of FZ. H phi is one over J omega mu epsilon rho, the second derivative with respect to phi and Z of fz and hz is 1 over j omega mu epsilon beta squared fz plus the second derivative with respect to z of fz and in deriving this final term here we use the same principle that we are assuming that fz satisfies the Helmholtz equation, and so we can substitute for the rather ugly expression we get directly from the curl relationship and get this more useful form there. So now we have ways to represent an arbitrary electromagnetic field in cylindrical coordinates in terms of an AZ component and an FZ component. So now we have to turn to the problem of how do we actually solve the Helmholtz equation. Of course, we, we know that the, the field components and the vector potentials have to satisfy the, the Helmholtz equation. But how do we actually 
get the solutions to that. So that's what we need to turn to now. But now we face the problem of solving the Helmholtz equation. So let's do it for the uh, Z component of the magnetic vector potential. And obviously the same steps would apply to the electric vector potential. So here's the Helmholtz equation, and as always, beta squared is omega squared mu epsilon. We're, we assume we're in a simple medium with constitutive parameters mu and epsilon. And we are going to attempt a separation of variables. That's about the only systematic way we have to solve the Helmholtz equation in an arbitrary coordinate system. We'll write a z as a product of a function f of rho times a function g of phi times a function h of z. And hopefully we will be able to separate out these three different functions and get three ordinary differential equations from this one partial differential equation. So what are the three terms that appear in the Laplacian? Remember that the Laplacian of a z had three terms. One was one over rho times the rho derivative of rho times the rho derivative. And the second was one over rho squared times the second derivative with respect to phi. And the third was second derivative with respect to z. So let's plug in az is f times g times h and see what we get here. So uh, we're going to get that the Laplacian of az is going to be, let's see. So in this case, right, these only have a rho derivative. So g and h don't depend on rho. So we can just factor those out. So in that case, we would get a g times an h. And then we would be left with, let's see, this would have then... Um, the rho derivative of f, so we'll just call that f prime times rho, and then the derivative of that times 1 over rho. So 1 over rho times rho times f prime prime, where the prime here means derivative with respect to rho. And then we have 1 over rho squared. Second derivative with respect to phi, well, that only affects the g there, so you get f and h don't depend on phi, and so then we would get g double prime, two derivatives, and then the last term, two derivatives with respect to z, that would affect the h term, so we get f, g, h double prime. And let's expand out this first term. So we use um, product rule here for the derivatives, so we get the first times the derivative of the second, so we get g h 1 over rho times first times derivative of the second, that'd be rho f double prime, plus the second times the derivative of the first, well, the derivative of rho with respect to rho is just 1, so it'd be plus f prime, plus 1 over rho squared f h g prime, plus f g h double prime. So now let's write out the entire Helmholtz equation. Laplacian of a z plus beta squared a z would be equal to, so in this first case, uh, let's see here, we'd have a row over row, so that would just leave f double prime times g times h. And then for the second term, we'd have a one over row f prime g h plus one over row f prime g h. And here we've got. Uh, 1 over rho squared, f g double prime h. And then here we've got f g h double prime. So those are all the terms from the Laplacian. And then we've got beta squared a z. So that would be plus beta squared. And a z is f g h. And that's all equal to 0. So there's our equation that we have to satisfy. and we want to try to separate out the f and the g and the h dependencies from each other one after another. So it looks like a good place to start would be to divide by f, g, h here because that would get rid of this dependence. And like here, that'd get rid of the f and the g and just leave an h double prime over h. 
So let's see, divide every one of these terms by FGH. So the first case, you'll get F double prime over F, and the G and H will cancel, and then you have plus one over rho. And here you'd get F prime over F, and the G and H would cancel, and then plus one over rho squared. And here the F and the H would cancel, leaving you a G double prime over G. And here the F and G would cancel, leaving you an H double prime over H. And here all three, F, G, and H would cancel. So now that is the form of the Helmholtz equation. Now remember our goal is to isolate or separate one of the coordinate dependencies on the left side of the equation and all the other dependents over on the right side. And it looks like here, right, right now, we've got h double prime over h, and that's the only place that z comes into play. All these other terms do not depend on z. So let's leave that on the left and move everything else over to the right. So that'll be minus everything else. f double prime over f plus one over rho, f prime over f, plus one over rho squared, g double prime over g, plus beta squared. Okay, so we just moved everything except the h double prime over h term over to the other side. And now here is the, the trick of, or the magic of separation of variables. The left side is at most a function of z, because h is a function of z. So it can't depend on rho or phi. The right side is not a function of z. There's no z dependence, only at most rho and phi dependence. And therefore, if a function of z is equal to something that's not a function of z, the only way that can be true is if both sides are equal to a constant. And so we're going to call this constant minus beta z squared. And that's without loss of generality because beta z could be an arbitrary complex number. And I can take an arbitrary complex number and make the negative of its square an arbitrary different complex number. So no loss of generality. But written in this form, of course, uh, it implies that in practice, we're most interested in the case where beta z is actually a real number. So this is a negative real number. Okay, So... What is then our equation for the h of z function? It's h double prime plus beta z squared h is equal to zero. And that's a nice simple equation that has solutions. Well, we could take complex exponentials or sines and cosines. We're going to use complex exponentials. We'll take a linear combination of e to the minus j beta z z and e to the plus j beta z z. Remember, this notation means an arbitrary linear combination of those two functions. So now we have separated out the z dependence and solved for that z dependence. So now we can go back up to this equation number one here and plug in that h double prime over h is minus beta z squared. Okay, so what do we get then? Let's rewrite that. That's f double prime over f plus one over rho, f prime over f plus one over rho squared, g double prime over g, plus we've got a beta squared there, and then a minus beta z squared there. That's equal to zero. Let's call that now equation two. We want to separate out, uh, let's see, it looks like we could easily separate out the g term. That would be the phi dependence. We'd have to multiply through by rho squared. Get rid of that 1 over rho squared factor. So multiply everything by rho squared. And keep the g double prime over g on the left. And everything else goes to the right. So we're multiply everything by rho squared. So we're going to get, when we move it to the right, we get a minus sign minus rho squared. Everything else in here would be f double prime over f plus 1 over rho, f prime over f. Uh, and then, remember, we, we already separated out this term over here. And then what's left is beta squared minus beta z squared. Wonderful. So we've separated out 
the G terms, that is the fee dependence. And so we've got at most a function of phi on the left and on the right we have a function that is not a function of phi. And therefore by the typical argument, this must be a constant. We're gonna call it minus nu squared. Again, no loss in generality. Nu can be an arbitrary complex number, but we will mostly be interested in the cases where nu is a real number. So what are the solutions in this case? The g double prime plus nu squared g is equal to zero. It's that same um, harmonic equation. And in this case, we'll take as our solutions, linear combinations of cosine and sine of nu phi. Now, in fact, in most, well, I shouldn't say most, but in many of the cases we'll look at, we're interested in fields that, say for a cylinder, have no boundary in the phi coordinate, right? Phi is the angle as you go around the cylinder. And so you have to be able to go around 2 pi and come back to where you were before. And so that means that the fields physically have to be periodic with period 2 pi in phi because you, you come back around, you're back in the same physical place. And so that will require, in many cases, nu to be an integer, say m. But it's possible to have other kinds of cases where maybe instead of a cylinder, maybe you had a wedge piece, like a pie shape of that cylinder, and this was some angle alpha. So now you don't have periodicity in phi, and so nu might just be an arbitrary real number. In fact, it could be an arbitrary complex number. And so we'll just leave it as nu, uh, but in many of the applications, it'll end up being an integer. Great. So we've got very nice simple solutions for the z dependence and for the phi dependence, right? So this is g of, g of phi. Okay, now all the easy stuff's over because now we have to dig in to what's left over here for the rho dependence. And that leads to a new equation that we're going to have to solve and spend considerable amount of time working out what the solutions are. And it's called Bessel's equation. Well, let's go back to our original formulation of the Helmholtz equation before we solve for the, the G and H functions. We had F double prime over F plus one over rho, F prime over F plus one over rho squared, g double prime over g plus h double prime over h plus beta squared is equal to zero. And we saw that h double prime over h is minus beta z squared. g double prime over g is minus nu squared. So this then gives us the equation f double prime over f plus one over rho f prime over f plus well let's see minus nu squared so minus nu squared over rho squared minus beta z squared plus beta squared is equal to zero so here's uh beta squared minus beta z squared, let's define that to be a new constant, beta rho squared. So that'll be beta squared minus beta z squared. And so let's plug that in here and then let's multiply everything through by, by f. So what do we get? We get f double prime plus one over rho f prime and then here, beta squared minus beta z squared is beta rho squared. So we get plus beta rho squared minus nu squared over rho squared times f is equal to zero. And that is the equation we have to solve now for f. 
Now, keep in mind, um, beta squared, right, which is omega squared, mu epsilon is also 2 pi over the wavelength squared as units of inverse meters squared. So likewise, so does beta z and beta rho. Those all have units of inverse meters squared. And of course, rho is a distance. It has units of meters. So it's always a good idea when you have an equation uh, to put it in a standard form in which you have only dimensionless variables. So let's do this. Let's define the dimensionless variable x. Now, this is not the x of rectangular coordinates, but just a dimensionless variable x, which will be beta rho times rho. Beta rho has units of inverse meters. Rho has units of meters. And then let's define y of x. And again, y is not the rectangular coordinate, but it's just a function, y of another variable x, which is our f of rho. Let's see. df d rho, which is f prime here, would be equal to, in that case then, using the chain rule, dy dx times dx d rho. But what is dx d rho? x is beta rho rho, so dx d rho is just beta rho. And likewise, the second derivative of f with respect to rho would be the second derivative of y with respect to x times two chain rule factors, beta rho squared. So f double prime is beta rho squared y double prime. And of course, the, the primes for f mean derivative with respect to rho, and the primes for y mean derivative with respect to x. The first term becomes beta squared y double prime. And then we have f prime is beta rho times dy dx, or times y prime. So that would be plus beta rho over rho y prime plus beta rho squared minus nu squared over rho squared. And f becomes y. Now there's a new differential equation in terms of this variable y. And now let's divide every, uh, everything by beta rho squared. And what are we going to get? First term will just become y double prime. Next term will cancel one beta rho and another beta rho will combine with that rho to give us x. So that'll be plus 1 over x y prime. And here beta rho squared over itself will leave us 1 minus nu squared, and again, beta rho squared times rho squared will be x squared times y is equal to 0. Now we got to solve this equation, and that is Bessel's equation, and the solutions are called Bessel functions. So we're not going to solve it fully in this lecture. We're going to look at some of the limiting or asymptotic behavior, just to analyze this a little bit before we jump into a full method of Frobenius solution. So first of all, let's look at the, the behavior for very small x, when, as x goes to 0. And I've, sorry, this was a x squared. You had rho squared times beta squared there. I put just x. It was 1 minus nu squared over x squared. So as x goes to 0, how does this behave. Well, um, look at this term here, 1, and then nu squared over x squared. So for any non-zero nu, when x gets really, really small, nu squared over x squared gets really, really big. So this equation, it would seem, would approximately start to behave as y double prime plus 1 over x y prime minus nu squared over x squared times y is equal to 0. Again, that's just neglecting 1 relative to nu squared over x squared. Well, this actually, uh, for non-zero nu, has solutions in terms of just powers of x. But y is equal to x to the p. So what's the second derivative? 
it's p times p minus one times x to the p minus two. And y derivative, well, that would be p times x to the p minus one, but then over x takes the power down one more, so it becomes x p minus two, and then minus new squared, y is x to the p, and then you get a minus two from the one over x squared. So x to the p minus two. So all the terms have an x to the p minus two, and that leaves p times p minus one plus p minus new squared, which is, well, here's a minus p and here's a plus p, so those cancel, so that just leaves p squared minus new squared is equal to zero, and the solutions are simply p is equal to plus or minus nu. So we see that for, certainly for, for nu is not equal to zero, it seems that the functions are two solutions that we would get because it's a second order differential equation. So we should get two linearly independent solutions. It seems that one would vary as x to the nu and the other would vary as x to the minus nu. Of course, if nu is a positive real number, this one would go to zero at x equals zero, and this one would blow up, have a singularity. And we'll see that that is indeed the case. Now, what about the special case of nu is equal to zero? Let's take a look at this equation, and let's look at if nu is equal to zero, what would that reduce to? That would reduce to y double prime plus one over x y prime is equal to zero. And that certainly has a, a simple solution. So let's see y1 is equal to one. We'll solve that because the derivative of that is zero and the second derivative is zero. That's trivial. But also another solution would be that y2, or let's at least say, let's just say it's asymptotic to squiggly line there. Log x would also work. And why is that? Because the derivative of the log x is one over x. So this would be, 1 over x times 1 over x, right? and the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. So minus 1 over x squared plus 1 over x times 1 over x is indeed equal to 0. So for the special case of nu is equal to 0, it looks like we'll get two solutions, one of which will behave like a constant for small x, and the other like a logarithm. And we'll see that indeed, when we look at this in a full analysis of this, we will get two functions. We'll call the first type, called Bessel functions of the first kind, j sub nu of x, and Bessel functions of the second type, y sub nu of x. And this one will be well behaved. Whereas this one will be singular at x is equal to zero. So this is the one that will have either the logarithmic or the negative power behavior, and this one will have either a constant or a positive power of x type of behavior. So that's the asymptotic behavior for, for small values of x. Now let's look at the case where x goes to infinity. What is the asymptotic behavior of the Bessel functions in that case? So in this case, it's very convenient to put Bessel's equation in a different form by letting y be equal to x to the minus one half power times a new function u. And if you do that, and the details are given in the PDF notes. I'm not going to go through just taking the derivatives of this and substituting in the differential equation. This is the equation that you end up with for u. It looks like this. u double prime plus 1 minus nu squared minus 1 half squared over x squared times u is equal to 0. So you solve that for u multiply by x to the minus one half, or one over the square root of x, and that's your solution y. Well, notice there's a very simple solution to this, and that is if nu is equal to plus or minus one half, the nu squared minus a half squared is equal to zero, and this equation reduces to u double prime plus u is equal to zero. 
And of course, of course, the solution to that would just be sine, some combination of sine and cosine of x. And then times one over the square root of x would give you your two solutions. So one y1 would be, say, sine x over the square root of x would be an exact solution for all values of x, not just in the limit, x goes to infinity, of Bessel's equation. And y2 could be taken to be cosine of x over the square root of x. And we'll see that indeed, the half integer order Bessel functions, right? So when we say, write something like j nu of x, this is the Bessel function of the first kind of order nu, and y nu of x is the Bessel function of the second kind of order nu. For the special case, uh, certainly, for nu is equal to a half, or we'll see in general, if nu is equal to an integer m plus a half, so we call these half integer order Bessel functions, that the Bessel functions themselves can be represented in terms of elementary functions, trig functions and powers of x. Now for other orders, for nu not a half integer, there's not such a simple solution. And in fact, when m is equal to zero here, and nu is equal to uh, plus or minus a half, uh, these are the kind of solutions that you can, you can get. But in general, not exactly now, but in general, as x goes to infinity, this second term here is going to get very, very small. And this equation will approximately look like u double prime plus u is equal to zero. And so even for arbitrary orders of the Bessel function, uh, the, the function should be asymptotic or behave more or less like either sine x over x or cosine x over x or some linear combination of those. We'll see that in general there will be, these functions behave like a linear combination of these two cases. So we can actually tell quite a bit about these functions just from this kind of back of the envelope analysis. We can see their behavior, all of these functions should have behavior for very large values of x, which look like a trig function over the square root of x. And for very small values of x, they look like a power of x or possibly a constant or log of x. Now, one last topic. Um, that we will need in order to solve for the general Bessel functions. And that is the idea of a generalized factorial function. So, and the reason is we were going to get a power series, which, for example, if you look at the power series for e to the x, you know, it's 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus and so on. 1 over n factorial, x to the n is the general term, and so on. We're going to get a similar, uh, although more complicated, series for the Bessel functions, and they're going to have denominators that are going to involve generalizations of the factorial function. So remember that the factorial function, n factorial, is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to times 2 times 1. And since all these terms together constitute n minus 1 factorial, you've got the recursion formula that n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. So uh, um, we're going to define the generalized factorial function, nu factorial, where nu is an arbitrary real number, or in fact it could be even a complex number. We're going to define it as this integral. The integral from 0 to infinity of t to the nu, e to the minus t dt. And some software packages like uh, Maxima allow you to uh, actually directly write something like nu factorial. So you could put, for example, pi factorial, and you could get a value out of it. And other uh, software packages use a different function called the gamma function and defined in terms of the factorial function as gamma of nu 
is equal to new minus one factorial. So in those cases, new factorial would be new times gamma of new if you're using Scilab or MATLAB or some other package like that. So we could start off with putting in zero for new, and we would get zero factorial is equal to zero to integral from zero to infinity of t to the zero, which is one, e to the minus t dt, which is easy to do, that's just equal to one. And then you can uh, show that if you take new minus one factorial to be equal to the integral from zero to infinity, t to the new minus one e to the minus t dt, then new factorial is equal to new times this integral. is equal to this integral up here, t to the new, e to the minus t, dt. In other words, you can do this by integration by parts, you can break this into this form. And so that tells you that this definition satisfies the recursion formula that new factorial is equal to new times new minus one factorial, just like the regular factorial function does. And it agrees, with n factorial when nu is equal to zero is equal to n is equal to zero. So this generalizes the factorial function at, at every non-zero, uh, non-negative rather integer value of nu, this gives you n factorial and then it interpolates between that other values of nu. So for example, uh, some cases you can work out, an important one is one half factorial. That's a weird looking thing, uh, but you can work that out put in uh, nu is equal to a half into this expression. You can do that integral and you get the value that it's root pi over two, which is 0 0.8862 and et cetera. And in fact, because nu factorial is equal to nu times nu minus one, this tells you if you, if this is the new axis, this is zero and this is one. And in fact, Right, zero factorial is equal to one factorial is equal to one. If you just know the values of new factorial over this interval, you can get all other values by using this recursion formula. Because if I want to go, let's say, get uh, 1.5 factorial, well, that would be 1.5 times 0.5 factorial. I could get 0.5 factorial out of this interval and then multiply that by 1.5 and come up here to a different value and then continue on adding, multiplying by different discrete powers, right? So I really only need to know this, this uh, integral over that, that interval in principle. Now this recursion has some interesting implications. If we turn it around and write that new minus one factorial, here, this guy here is equal to new factorial over new, and we say, what happens to that when, um, well, for example, let's look at, uh, maybe we want minus one half factorial. What would that be? So we could take nu is equal to one half, and then this would be one half minus one is minus one half. And that would be one half factorial over one half. And we know what one half factorial is, it's the square root of pi over two, and so that divided by one half would just be the square root of pi. So we would see that minus a half factorial is the square root of pi. Now, a very interesting thing happens if we look at, for example, what is minus one factorial using this recursion. So that would be nu is equal to zero, then zero minus one would be minus one factorial. So that would be equal to zero factorial, which is one over zero one over zero, right? That would blow up. That would be infinite. And by extension, minus two factorial would be minus one factorial over minus one. And minus one factorial also blows up, as we said. So that also, minus two factorial must also blow up. And in fact, all 
the factorials of all the negative integers must blow up, must have poles, there must be singularities at those values. And we'll actually make use of that to decide some or illuminate some of the properties of the, the Bessel functions. So this is the generalized factorial function. And we're going to make use of that in our analysis. Um, it's sometimes in looking at these series for Bessel functions, useful to look at approximations for new factorial when new gets very big and new, the factorial function gets really, really big as its argument grows. A good approximation for this is the so-called Stirling formula. New factorial is the square root of two pi, new to the power new plus a half, e to the minus new. So this thing grows roughly as new to the new, which, which really, really explodes. Um, sometimes it's convenient to look at the logarithm of that. And that would just be then the log of the square root of two, just using the properties of logarithms, plus new plus a half times the log of new minus new. And most uh, software packages like Scilab, MATLAB, et cetera, will have functions that can, um, we already talked about calculating new factorial, but they'll usually have some uh, function to directly calculate this logarithm, which can be very useful.